Well, good evening, everyone. As we get started here, we are going to be reminded of our um, our tradition around here, which is uh, to look into some of the more fascinating aspects of church history and all the things that come with it. Um, before we even get beginning here, I wanted to address a couple of things. Um, one, uh, kind of some housekeeping measures. Um, you may have noticed the uh, an update to some of the graphics around and some of the um, issues that, um, or some of the ways that we do things. And um, you can see new splash screens. Uh, you'll be seeing uh, an update to album art and things like this. Now that is because for the past couple of weeks, I've been working behind the scenes uh, to make more of um, more of what we will be going into um, when we when we begin the new walkthrough, which I'll announce here in just a second. Um, there's been a lot of work uh, being done uh, in preparation for that. Uh, a lot of laying out of episodes, a lot of research, a lot of extra uh, writing and reading and so forth. Um, and so. Uh, that having been said, I will say tonight is the last of the deep dives, uh, and I wanted to fit this one in because it is such a fascinating one. Um, it is it is one that uh, I look forward to this evening, and uh, that is the selected uh, works and the life of Anne Steele, and um, and this will be the last deep dive out of the walkthroughs. As I had described before, uh, what we will begin here in a couple of weeks is a brand new walkthrough which as I have planned out is is going to be extraordinarily long. Um, I have, currently I have 25 episodes between the years 30 and 100, and um, I'm gonna kind of hold off on making more episode layouts um, because uh, I don't honestly know how long that could go for. Um, my current plan, and that is subject to change, my current plan is to hold these church history uh, classes once uh, every other week. Um, there's a reason for that. Um, I'm in the middle of my dissertation, and that right now is priority for me, and I am currently set to finish probably February of next year. Uh, after that, we can certainly reassess and uh, go back up to uh, once a week. But right now, the kind of depth that we're going to be working through the walkthrough is, is going to require uh, the same kind of you know, rigorous reading that uh, these deep dives have taken. And because of that, and because I'm going to be bringing in primary sources and, um, and all sorts of things like this, that is, uh, I want to put out quality stuff and I'm not in any abject hurry to get through all of this. In fact, I want to do it quite slowly. And so I'm looking forward to, um, uh, looking forward to doing this on my, uh, on my, uh, long form time scale rather than on my short one. So um, as I continue through that walkthrough, it's going to be long. It's going to be as exhaustive as I can do it. And uh, we're going to be doing all sorts of uh, all sorts of things along the way. If you want to see, um, I don't know about actually, hang on a second. I'm going to bring this up. I wasn't planning on doing this. But if you want to kind of see what I am thinking about, um, here, let me pull this up. The expanded walkthroughs of church history, and here, because I know some of you are asking about this. Um, you want to see the layout of this? Let me put this up here. Welcome to a live stream, right? So here is my current layout for the new walkthrough, as we're going to be starting here in uh, a couple of weeks. Um, each of these would be an entire uh, episode. Now, this is all completely subject to change. I am in the middle of um, working through how exactly to teach this. I've never seen a class taught like this. I've never been a part of one. Um, so I'm kind of designing it as I go along. It's, it's roughly chronological, but uh, then it turns topical. Uh, you can see things like that. Um, so, yeah, for anyone who's really interested, let me spend about uh, two minutes and just kind of show you this here. Uh, what I'm thinking about. Um, the first episode is what is church history? Um, that's a that's a great one. Then the why of studying church history. Why do we do this? The effects it has on all sorts of things that we do and things that we think. Uh, the theological aspect of churches uh, and church history, the definition of church, uh, invisible church versus visible church, Christ is the head, etc., etc. 
Um, and here we take a, a, a current, I'm not sure if we're going to do this here or if we're going to do this after the Jerusalem episode. We'll have to see how this goes and lays out. Um, and the earliest church, it's worship, it's communion, immediate baptism of those who heard the word and believed, gathering in the temple, so forth. Um, you can see we're uh, largely in the book of Acts here at the beginning. Uh, the multi-apostolic leadership in the universal church. Philip and the church in Ethiopia as it begins. And um, that's one of the things I really want to include in on this next walkthrough is all sorts of branches of the church as well. The Ethiopic church, the Coptic church, um, uh, the, East, uh, the churches of the East and uh, things like this that usually don't get a lot of attention in Western church history courses. Um, it's, that's going to require a lot more reading. And that's one of the reasons why I want to go slowly on this because I want to do it well. I don't know about right. I want to do it to my satisfaction. How's that? Um, Antioch and its significance, which is more significant than most people realize. It was kind of the number three city in the Roman Empire uh, after, um, after Rome and Alexandria. Antioch is absolutely essential, uh, both to the empire as well as to Christianity. Paul, the Apostle of the Gentiles, um, Apostolic Liturgy, and Developments. Uh, we'll see some of the first hymns, like the Carmen Christi. Um, we'll see some of the references, even in secular sources, regarding uh, hymns sung to Christ as God, uh, sung to Jesus as God. Um, effect of Gentiles on worship practices from inherited Judaistic liturgy, something I've been reading about that uh, absolutely needs to come into the discussion here. Uh, 12th episode, the question of Peter and the presumptions of Rome. Obviously, I've uh, dealt with this in one of the deep dives before, but we will put it here in its place and then expand upon that. Um, this has been something I actually just finished my second book on that topic uh, here in just the past couple of weeks. Um, fascinating stuff. Uh, this one I really want to throw in because I've never heard anyone really talk about it. The odd role of Titus, semi-apostle or uh, proto-elder. What, what in the world is going on there? Because we seem to have... Um, a, a certain way in which that the roles uh, during the apostolic era are, are squishy and are adaptive. So I just find that fascinating. So I want to spend a whole night on that. Uh, the church in Ephesus and its mystical culture. Um, Ephesus was the center of magic in the ancient world. I think it is owed its old entire uh, episode, especially considering the the epistle to the Ephesians, you can see how it goes. The inevitable New Testament, nature of canonicity, inspiration, early church's view of the New Testament, the expectation of a written word um, is something that is downplayed a lot and with no good reason whatsoever. In fact, there is a lot to see to the contrary, especially the way that the earliest apostolic fathers would interact with the New Testament writings. Um, obviously we also have here elders and deacons, the multiplicity of, um, of the church age leadership reflects the multi-apostolic leadership in the, uh, in the earliest church, the elders and the deacons, and then bishops, always the fascinating things. Where did they come from? This idea of metropolitan bishops that kind of try to tie together, uh, all the elders and deacons and the individual gatherings inside of a larger city. This is one that I really want to include in as well because it is both downplayed and exaggerated on the uh, on the, the two uh, extremes. And I would like us to take a realistic view of it. What exactly do we have? What are we working on with regards to the role of women in the apostolic church? Um, martyrdom in the earliest church, the 19th episode, Thomas goes to India. Fascinating story, something that uh, some of these things have uh, definitely come out of um, archaeology as of late. Um, the Eclipse of the Miraculous Norm. Uh, this is one that I've been working on just outside of this class and would be a really interesting one to include. Again, all of these are very tentative. Um, if this sounds fascinating to you, uh, wonderful, welcome. Uh, the Neronian Persecution, obviously 64 AD, and then the Siege of Jerusalem, why it happened, loss of the temple, the effect on the church and theology and so forth. Um, these things are all very important. Uh, syncretism, docetism, early Gnosticism is another episode that will probably actually expand out into three episodes. Who knows? Um, the Didache, we've done a deep dive on this already, but in its context, uh, we will be focusing on m all sorts of things attached to it. Uh, persecution under Domitian, um, really important, very uh, expressive. Uh, Clement to the Corinthians, again, first Clement. 
uh, Christian worship in 100 AD. Uh, I, this is kind of one of those things that I'd, I'd like to think about, at least on the front end, that that establishing worship practices and checking in with its development over the years throughout the church. It might get unruly to do that, you know, long term, but at least for the earliest church, I think it'd be good to kind of keep a beat on, you know, what do we know about all that, right? Uh, the earliest surviving sermon, Second Clement, Ignatius of Antioch and his letters, Martyrdom, Polycarp, and Epistle of Barnabas. So that that kind of gives you an idea of what I'm looking at, right, and what I'm intending here uh, as we as we move forward. So that gives you a ten minute kind of introduction to that. And um, tonight, though, however, we are not dealing with all of that. Tonight, we are working on um, my last deep dive that's disconnected from the walkthrough. So here's here's what I'm going to say before we even get started here. Um, the new walkthrough is going to start here in three weeks. Uh, it is a little bit earlier than I had planned. I was planning for the end of May, but I have been able to work ahead uh, for a number of things and uh, things that will be uh, helpful, things that will be necessary to be able to uh, make this work. Um, there's going to be two changes to it. One, it will be at 7 p.m. on Wednesday evenings, and uh, it will be every other week. Um, in addition to that, it will not be live, uh, but it will be premiered. It will be premiered live. Uh, if, if you don't ever really check in anything like that, here's what that means. If you're on YouTube and you watch it live, you will be able to come and watch it live just the same as all the time. But it will just have been pre-recorded ahead of time and posted Um if you listen through podcasts, what this means is that you'll actually get your episodes early. Uh, usually it takes a day or two for me to work through and edit everything, but this will have it all edited and set up beforehand, and so we'll be able to just work through it like that. Um, you'll get the idea. So the the first of the um, new walkthrough is going to start on May 1st, Wednesday, uh, 2024. And uh, however long that goes for, um, based on... My current trajectory, I have no earthly idea. Six, seven years, maybe. Um, if it takes shorter than that, great. If it takes longer than that, great. I have absolutely no goal in mind and no specific end date and really no reason to do an end date. I'm 40 years old. I could spend 40 years on this and be just fine. Um, but hey, let's let's not do that. Let's let's dive into Ann Steele. Um, I, I ran into this uh, marvelous woman. Um, and, and her writings not very long ago. And I, as soon as I saw one of her hymns and understood part of her story, I knew I wanted to do a deep dive on her. Um, and, and with regards to the way she talks, the way that she writes, the way that she thinks uh, is laudable in the highest extent. And as we always uh, express, one of our main purposes with regards to all of this is to seek wisdom from those who have gone before us. And uh, you would be hard pressed to find a, a, a greater con, uh, um, concentration of wisdom in a single person. Uh, Anne Steele is a Baptist hymn writer from Southern England uh, in the 18th century, in the 1700s, and she is the daughter of a particular Baptist minister. Uh, if you are not familiar. Particular Baptist just simply means that uh, you have a, uh, a certain view of the doctrine of election. Uh, it was a pretty significant discussion um, back in the 17th century, which, again, as we will do our walkthroughs, you will see the importance of that, you know, probably sometime in 2035, whenever we get to the 1700s and 1600s. Um, she is the daughter of a timber merchant and a and particular Baptist minister, William Steele, um, who died in 1769. Um, she lost her mother at the age of three, and her one of her friends, who was a, a potential suitor and husband, uh, drowned when she was 20. Uh, and uh, before they were able to be married, uh, she then committed herself to lifelong singleness uh, m most of the sources that we have, she stated that she did this so that she could actually focus on writing, and um, and that is a um, remarkable thing as it was. She also lost her stepmother at 43. For much of her life, she was very sickly. Uh, she had um, either multiple illnesses or one very long chronic illness that we don't really fully understand. 
Um, she was bedridden at many different times for the last several years of her life. She certainly was. Um, and, um, in some ways she actually expected to die before her father. We're going to actually read one of her letters to her father, uh, to that effect. So should she be concerned about that? And the prevailing theory is that she actually had malaria for much of her life and it went undiagnosed based on all of the, the different pains that she described and the recurrence of fevers and, um, all sorts of things. Why study her? Well, in the 1800s, in both England and especially in America, where the, the uh, impetus of, of theological development fell, uh, the writings of, of Anne Steele found their way into hundreds and hundreds of editions of hymnals. Um, many of these songs were sung throughout uh, the colonies, throughout the early uh, Americas, and then uh, certainly into the 1800s, both Methodist, Baptist, um, and, and elsewise. You will find her uh, hymns in many, many different um, uh, collections of hymns. Uh, and her writing is remarkable. It, it is something that she is able to address some of the hardest things that we ever run into, and yet to to express it in ways that uh, that speak of a deep seated respect for the God that she serves and her confidence that He is bringing her through whatever it is that He will bring her through. Um, there is a there is a, a constancy of focus on the transitory nature of this world. That this is this is not the end all and be all. This is not the the ultimate place that we will be. Uh, this is not the place where our hopes should rest, nor where our definition of success should come from. But instead, we should see all of these things as temporary and working in us a certain uh, weight of glory beyond all comparison. And she talks about this in so many different ways. When you understand that she was dealing with sicknesses and losses that um, were a little bit beyond the norm and that her response to it, you'll, you'll see it in her words. Uh, I want to spend most of this time actually dealing with her words. So, um, let's, let's keep going here. Uh, she's always referring, referring to the beauties and the gift that is the world. Um, and it only encouraged her to think of our eternal dwelling and how marvelous it will be by, by way of comparison. Uh, whenever she sees something gorgeous, whenever she realizes a certain way in which this realm works, she connects even the best that we have to, then it shows us that the eternal state is far better. She always sees it as this uh, is a dim portrayal of what uh, amazingness follows, right? Her temporal sicknesses uh, throughout her life, she will write in various ways, remind her of eternal life and how there will be no sicknesses attached to that. Again, her lost loved ones made her contemplate resurrection. Um, this is the way to suffer. It really is. These things that teach us what we lose, that we don't have, that we would aim towards something else or something higher uh, is is the the essence of maturity as it, as it comes out of her pen. Um, her style is described as that of simplicity of thought and phrase while never being simple uh, and a devout and tender emotion without being sentimental or pedantic. And that was written in the memoirs by John Shepard. I should mention that in the show notes, you're going to find um, or in the uh, in the notes, you know, posted either on the episode or uh, posted on the video here, you're going to find three links. Um, one is to a very helpful uh, dissertation written on uh, on Anne Steele and on her hymns, and it includes a pretty good biography in there. Uh, well, pretty good. I you know a bi biography far beyond anything I just gave you. Um, and if you want her whole collection of hymns, you can find them there as well, linked. And also um, one of the books from which you can pull all of her works, and you can go read all of it: her memoirs, her poems, her hymns, everything. Um, that's going to be at archive.org. And all of these things I sought out to be freely available. Um, I never want to post things that are behind a paywall. Um, I think our history should be freely accessible. Um, something else that we'll talk about in a later date. Um, so uh, with all of that, let's go read some of her works. Um, this is 
this is something that I, I've been looking forward to for a while here. Um, here is a collection. I want to walk through six of these hymns. And I chose these ones uh, after reading about a hundred of her hymns um, because they really uh, express the essence of uh, kind of the compendium of the types of things that she writes on. And and her hymns are just just remarkable. And I want you to see these. My favorite one here is Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. Um, we'll get there. Right now, however, I want us to start here. Almighty author of my frame. <clears throat> Almighty author of my frame. To thee our vital powers belong. Thy praise, delightful, glorious theme, demands my heart, my life, and my tongue. My heart, my life, my tongue are thine. O be thy praise their blessed employ. But may my song with angels join, nor sacred awe forbid the joy. Thy glory is the seraph lyre, on all its strings attempts in vain. Then how shall mortals dare aspire? in thought to try the unequal strain. Again, before we get too far into this, she begins with this concept of humility, this concept of how she interacts with the world and her response to the reality that God is himself uh, able to see who she is. God has made her. He is the author of her frame. Uh, all of our vital powers belong to him. Uh, and, and there's been several uh, adaptations of this hymn. Uh, turn all of these into, uh, into plural, uh, demands our heart, our life, our tongue. I, I went with her original writings here because I think it's important to read her in her own context. Um, it demands her heart, her life, her tongue. Why? Because God made us. And because he made us, these things are owed back to him. And so this is why she comes in and says, My heart, my life, my tongue are thine. Oh, be thy praise, their best, their blessed employ. That This is what they should be concerned with. This is what they should be focused on. But may my song with angels join, nor sacred awe forbid the joy. And all of these things, it seems that we come up short. And she says, Thy glories, the seraphic lyre, on all its strings attempts in vain. In other words, the, the seraph's songs, the seraph's, um, uh, you know, uh, approaches of these things, their harps, uh, it seems that there is a certain vanity with that or, or, or worthlessness in it. How could we dare to aspire to be the ones to worship you in thought to, the, uh, to try the unequal strain? In other words, um, our worship is not filling up some lack in God. We don't have the ability to serve God in that manner as if he lacks anything and that you can pull right from the scriptures. And she continues on and says, Yet the great sovereign of the skies to mortals bends a gracious ear, nor the mean tribute will despise if offered with a heart sincere. Now, this is kind of the linchpin of the whole thing. Why is it that our worship, uh, why is it that our praise actually extends to heaven's throne? It is not because it is done exceptionally. It is not because it is done well. It is not because it is done with our our greatest abilities. No, it is because of heart sincere and because of God's gracious ear. It is, it is simply a remarkable statement to say that the sovereign of the skies bends his gracious ear to the mortals below. He does not owe it to us to listen to praise or prayer. It is his grace that ensures these things. Um, and he says, nor the mean tribute will despise if offered with a heart sincere. In other words, we cannot just go, hey, I'm going to mindlessly pray or I'm going to mindlessly uh, sing a song and expect God to just be thankful that I showed up. Uh, she says here and makes it really quite clear that these types of things are not despised because God is gracious to those with sincere hearts. You know, I mean, it's, it, it really is the worship side of a, um, a broken and contrite heart he will not despise, right? And so she refers uh, straight to the Lord. She's saying, great God, accept the humble praise and guide my heart and guide my tongue while to thy name I trembling raise the grateful though unworthy song. That's a great song to express the nature of worship and why it is acceptable. 
It is not acceptable. And, and you can see this if we studied this in context, because the context of England in the 1700s, obviously, um, you have uh, the issues that were going on with the colonies. But in the, in the church and some of the issues that were going on, you have beginning parts of the um, uh, of the Enlightenment are working, are not beginnings of, of the radical Enlightenment, but definitely the the expansion of the Enlightenment and the dealings in the Anglican Church, specifically with the the Puritan uh, dealings of the previous century, still had their rumblings around. Obviously, these things stick around, and and really set in some people's mind that there is a performative aspect to worship that makes it acceptable, and. What Anne Steele is going to point out here is that no such performance reaches the ears of heaven because it's so good. Performative worship does not reach heaven because of its skill. It reaches not heaven. In fact, it stays on earth and God must bend his gracious ear to even hear it. And so what does she say? Why is it that um, our great God should accept humble praise And she says, she asks God to guide her heart, to guide her tongue. While to thy name I trembling raise the grateful, though unworthy song. And here you will see something that shows up in a lot of her writing. And that is gratitude. Gratitude to God for all things. And you will see this come up too. Unworthiness. I really hope that some of you go and actually pull up her complete works that were gathered together um, and posted up on archive. They're in the show notes. Just sit with that book for a while. It is simply a remarkable thing to read. Um, Those five verses of Almighty Author of My Frame um, really set the stage for this. The next song that I want to walk you through is Father of Mercies in Thy Word. The way that she expresses our relationship to the Word of God uh, in these twelve stanzas, and they're they're usually only um, four, uh, excuse me, four lines apiece, and uh, this one is no exception to that. Father of mercies, in Thy Word, let's let's go into this. Father of mercies, in Thy Word, what endless glory shines! Forever be Thy name adored for these celestial lines. Again. Heaven is the origin of the word of God. Here we, uh, we sing of the scriptures. She writes of the scriptures that God's name is to be adored and the celestial lines come right off the page to her, right? Second stanza. Here minds of heavenly wealth disclose their bright unbounded store. The glittering gem no longer glows and India boasts no more. Again, you can see history showing up in here, but you will see all sorts of uh, references to this, that there is something in scripture that is worth the work. It is worth the, um, it is worth the listening. It is worth the attention. It is worth mining for. It is worth all of that. Third stanza, here may the wretched sons of want exhaustless riches find, riches above what earth can grant and lasting as the mind. Here the fair tree of knowledge grows and yields a free repast. Sublimer sweets than nature knows, inviting, uh, invite the longing taste. Here may the blind and hungry come and light and food receive. Here shall the meanest guest have room and taste and see and live. Um, aside from the uh, rhyming receive and live, uh, which is a little bit uh, strange. Um, here she's expressing this very nature. Uh, these things that Jesus spent much time on is that the, the blind are healed, the hungry are fed, etc. Things the light of the gospel shines out. What is it that the blind see? It is the truth of the gospel. What is it that the hungry receive? They receive righteousness. These things that Jesus even spoke of on many occasions. Here shall the meanest guest have room, and taste and see and live. Amidst the gloomy wilds below, when dark and sad we stray, here beams of heaven relieve our woe and guide to endless day. This right here, the sixth stanza, which sits around the middle of this song, expresses something that shows up in her writings all the time, and that is the the temporal nature of this world is, is such that it is described in contrasting terms for what promises are given to us. 
this is this is one of those aspects of the Christian life that continually we're reminded of is that our situation does not really reflect our birthright. Our birthright in Christ gives us a new name, gives us a new home, promises indescribable. And here she writes and says that that's not really the situation that we find ourselves in. Often we find ourselves in, as she calls it here, gloomy wilds and dark and sad situations. Here, she says, meaning the scriptures, here springs of consolation rise to cheer the fainting mind and thirsty souls receive supplies and sweet refreshment find. Again, what is the salve in this gloomy wild? But the scriptures. Here we're not talking about her tradition. We're not talking about, uh, you know, uh, going to family's house for Christmas. Uh, here she's talking about in order to survive through all of these tempests of this life, there must be an anchor that holds. There must be something that is from that endless day that is here in the present with us. And that is, in short, the scriptures. And so she, she continues on in the eighth stanza. When guilt and terror, pain and grief, united rend the heart. Here sinners meet divine relief and cool the raging smart. Again, all of the things that we have from this world, guilt, terror, pain, grief. She says, what if, what if they all come together to destroy my heart? What is my relief? Where does it come from? And she says here, here sinners meet divine relief and cool the raging smart. Here the Redeemer's welcome voice spreads heavenly peace around and life and everlasting joys attend the blissful sound. But when his painful sufferings rise, delightful, dreadful scene, angels may read with wondering eyes that Jesus died for men. There's a reference to 1 Peter 1, right? <clears throat> this, this whole expression, Christ walked this path before us. No matter how difficult what we are going through is, Christ having walked this path before us shows us that this is no surprise to the Lord. Nor is it something that undoes his promises. It is not something that can call us into question to say, hey, your circumstances are so uh, severe. Your circumstances are so beyond that you are somehow warranted to lose faith in the Father's promises. No, there are no such circumstances. And the people of God are obligated to remember those promises. Elsewise, they should be fully undone. The last two stanzas. Oh, may these heavenly pages, referring again to the scriptures, my ever dear delight, and still new beauties may I see, and still increasing light. Divine instructor, gracious Lord, be thou forever near. Teach me to love thy sacred word, and view my Savior there. Her responses continually remind Christians, and you will see it in all of her songs, constantly remind the Christian that at the end of our lives is not the end of our suffering only, but the welcome of the world that is promised to those who love the Lord and are loved by the Lord. Christ did not inform us to walk a path that he did not already walk. God does not instruct us to do things he does not already himself do. He does not tell us to love mercy and to seek justice and then turn around and do neither. The Lord both loves mercy and seeks justice. He did not tell us to walk humbly with him, and then he does not, upon his, uh, his condescension to man, fail to act humbly with us. He does act humbly with us. He speaks to us humbly. He speaks to us on our level. And even Christ himself truly lived on our level as one of us. It is the ultimate expression of humility. And so when we, when we see these things, not only does God not instruct things that he himself does not do, he also does not express how we should interact with the world without himself having already done this, nor does he walk us through sufferings that he himself is not willing to go through. What do we see in the words, sacred pages? but that the Savior continually shines through every page.
from Genesis to Revelation. There is no place where we will find Christ is absent and unnecessary in order to understand and to appreciate all that God has done and all he is continuing to do. Continuing on with a the theme, this is uh, one of those really sweet songs that I ran across of hers, uh, is Weary Souls Invited to Rest. And I wanted to introduce these because these are some of her more um, influential songs. And so this is not just some person that's written somewhere that's had no effect on you. If you if you are in the Baptist world, if you're in the Methodist world, um, even if you're in the Presbyterian world, you have been affected by uh, these songs and influenced by them, even if you've never heard her name, uh, even if you've never heard these songs. Uh, they have affected people that have affected people that have affected you. It's just kind of how all of this works. So let's look at this third song here. Weary souls invited to rest. Come weary souls with sin distressed. The Savior offers heavenly rest. The kind, the gracious call obey and cast your gloomy fears away. Again, earth is referred to as a gloomy wild or a gloomy place uh, that gives us gloomy fears. Um, again, weary souls with sin distress, the Savior offers heavenly rest. Uh, this, this constant dichotomy between earthly and heavenly reminds us consistently that the only connection between these is the grace of God who calls from the heavenly to the earthly to follow him and leave gloominess behind. Stanza two, oppressed with guilt, a painful load. O come and spread your woes abroad, divine compassion and mighty love. With all the painful load remove. Here mercy's boundless ocean flows. To cleanse your guilt and heal your woes. Pardon and life and endless peace. How rich the gift. How free the grace. Again you can see a lot of the uh, particular Baptist theology showing up through here. But specifically broadly um, uh, English theology uh, you will have focused on, and really just because this is in the wake, well, not just because it's in the wake, but the way it's talked about is this is in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, is is the the emphasis on the freeness of God's grace, that it is a gift, that in order to be grace, it must be a free gift. It is not something that we are to interact with on the basis that we earned it somehow, or that it was owed to us, or that we even sought it out and pulled it from the Lord. It is that God has given pardon, life, and peace, and none of these things are earned by us. That kind of um, what was later collated into the five solas, the one referred to as grace alone. It is, it is something that is given to us. It is not something that is earned. Stanza four. Lord, we accept with thankful heart the hope thy gracious words impart. We come with trembling, yet rejoice, and bless the kind, inviting voice. Uh, here, again, we are describing the nature of salvation and how that uh, has come to somebody's experience. Dear Savior, she continues, let thy powerful love confirm our faith, our fears remove, and sweetly influence every breast and guide us to eternal rest. Um, in in all of the things that she uh puts forward in a song like this. We have uh, the beginning uh, of weariness and then the ending at rest. Uh, the the parallels that go back and forth and the, the interplay of, of concepts of God as the Savior, the Savior, heavenly rest, um, coming out of this powerful love and in, um, in, in all of it being a work that God has orchestrated and pieced together, expressing from these words, the idea of how the gospel affects people, how it is that we, in our faith, our fears vanish, right? What does she say there? Confirm our faith, uh, or excuse me, let thy powerful love confirm our faith and our fears remove. Because as faith increases, fears decrease. There is an inverse relationship between these things. And so she expresses not that God would just continue to be gracious to her, but that God would be gracious to her in the means of confirming her faith and increasing it and removing her fears. She would rather some of the rest of eternity come to now. And this is the interplay that you keep seeing. 
in in believing and in trusting in the promises of God, we have this this relationship between that which is in the eternal, ultimate, perfect, heavenly place affecting the things here on the earth. So that rest that's there, by focusing on the promises attached to that, transfers and, and brings some of that rest to the present. And so we can actually rest in the presence of God. We can rest in the promises of God, knowing what is certain, not because we have experienced it, but because God has promised it. And so this constant focus on the word of God, the promises that he has given, let his love confirm our faith, let our fears be removed as he guides us to eternal rest. But until then, let, let until the eternal rest, until that endless peace, let some of that rest and peace invade our gloomy fears today. Again, the parallels between stanzas happens all the time and it's pretty awesome let's look at the fourth song christ the physician of souls stands in one deeper the wounds which sin hath made where shall the sinner find a cure in vain alas is nature's aid the work exceeds all nature's power now you're going to see her here interacting with the claims of some of the modernists that are coming out that that there's certain aspects to man's uh, to human condition that can be fixed uh, by man's power, especially in nature, that we can seek out the scientific the the design of the world and that somehow can liberate us from all these things it's kind of the world that modernism is beginning to build and so what she's saying here is here's something that you just simply can't do with that there are wounds that sin makes where should the sinner find a cure you cannot just go and distill it from some flower or some uh some elixir from nature somewhere in vain she says alas is nature's aid the work exceeds all of nature's power there's nothing in the created world that we can actually solve the issue of sin so she says sin like a raging fever again calling to mind she dealt with these all of her life sin like a raging fever reigns with fatal strength in every part the dire contagion fills the veins and spreads its poison to the heart and can no sovereign balm be found, and is no kind physician nigh, to ease the pain and heal the wound, ere life and hope forever fly. So her first half of this song just deals with the human condition, this frustration that we have a moral quandary and no way to solve it. What are we to do with our guilt? And this is something that I would put before anybody. If you have not come to Christ yet, what are you doing with your guilt? How are you dealing with it? You cannot just deny it. It will wake you up at night. It will follow you around without your consent. It will invade your mind. It will invade your soul. It will overwhelm everything that you are considering and trying to explain away. But your guilt will ever be there. There is nothing in nature's power, she says, that can actually rid us of these things. And so she asks hypothetically, um, or really rhetorically, can no sovereign balm be found? Is no kind physician nigh to ease the pain and heal the wound ere life and hope forever fly? It's going to kill me. It's going to take me out. There, It will interrupt any hope that I have. But here it sits, an, an opening and festering wound, a pain that cannot be assuaged with anything, what shall fix it? Here's her answer. There is a great physician near. Look up, O fainting soul, and live. See in his heavenly smiles appear such ease as nature cannot give. See in the Savior's dying blood life, health, and bliss abundant flow. Tis only this dear sacred flood can ease thy pain and heal thy woe. Sin throws in vain its pointed dart, for here a sovereign cure is found, a cordial for the fainting heart, a balm for every painful wound. This is 
an expression of how salvation is unkillable by those who would look at it and say that somehow there is a way for sin to undo what the great physician does. And so she, she connects it all to this concept of health and Christ is the great physician, not just giving us uh, a, a, a secret elixir and then we somehow come to health, but no, he is a great physician. He is nearby. The soul is to look up to him. He simply smiles here and it eases in the pain in a way that no nature and no part of nature can do. And it takes his life. His dying blood leaves to her life blood, right? You had the poison that spreads through the veins and into the heart. And here she, she parallels it with the Savior's dying blood that brings life as it flows. Again, this, this antithetical back and forth is just, it's just beautiful poetry. I mean, the way that she expresses that the raging fever reigns because of, well, sin is the raging fever. It reigns with fatal strength in every part. The dire contagion fills the veins and spreads its poison to the heart. That flow through the blood uh, is what's killing her. And then she comes down here and says, the dying blood from the Savior flows and it brings her life. Right? It's just, it's just great poetry. I love it. Tis only this dear sacred flood that can ease thy pain and heal thy woe. And so she finishes off the song. She says, sin throws in vain its pointed dart. In other words, sin tries to kill us now. But what does she say? For here, a sovereign cure is found a cordial for the fainting heart, and a balm for every painful wound. Does that mean we are sinless? Is that what she's arguing? No, it is not arguing that. What she is expressing is the reality that the solution for sin has been found. I I was online just recently and, and saw somebody mocking the idea that uh, sin being forgiven is, is, a, is a shortcut that just can allow people to, and again, this kind of slander exists and always has, just allow people to sin as much as they want and they get out of jail free. <coughs> Certainly not what the gospel teaches. Not in any way. But a remarkable one, Christ the Physician of Souls. Let's go to the next song, fifth song. And again, I should note, a, a lot of these were written as poems that were turned into songs, ones that she did, ones that uh, others did, um, but always with knowledge that these should be sung in one way or another. And a lot of them are written to meters, uh, to very common uh, tunes. Fifth song, or penultimate. Far from these narrow scenes of night is the title. Far from these scenes of night unbounded glories rise and realms of joy and pure delight unknown to mortal eyes fair land could mortal eyes but half its charm explore how would our spirits long to rise and dwell on earth no more no cloud those regions know realms ever bright and fair for sin the source of mortal woe can never enter there oh may the prospect fire our hearts with ardent love Till wings of faith and strong desire beat every thought above. That's the whole song. I love the way she talks about this. Because what she's expressing is the idea that what promises are given to us are the exact opposite of what sin has given to us. And isn't that always the wisdom that we have pulled from this, uh, these uh, instances of church history, that sin itself always over promises? And it always under delivers. It tells you that, yes, indeed, this may be wrong, but it'll be worth it. And then you do it. And it is not only not worth it, it is the exact opposite. It causes pains and wounds and distress and separations and anxieties. Despairs. But the promises of God are not so. They continually drive us to see that there is something far beyond all of this, far beyond 
what our eyes can see, far beyond what our hands can yet touch, far beyond what we can perceive. Again, the disconnect between earth and heaven. The disconnect between our sicknesses here and our life there. Why is it that that world will know none of these things? Why is it that that world will be dominated by realms that are bright and fair? It is because sin cannot enter there. Sin, that woe-casting frustration that led us towards all evils, things that we could only make up in the dark. She says, I would rather may the prospect fire our hearts with ardent love. In other words, may the knowledge of the promises of God affect us here where we are. May the prospect fire our hearts with ardent love until these wings of faith and strong desire beat every thought above. In other words, why, why continue to focus ourselves only and merely upon the things of this earth? When Anne Steele lost her betrothed, when he drowned at 20, when she was 20 rather, she made up her mind to be single her whole life, the rest of her life. And she never married. And... She lived uh, near her dad. Obviously, her mom had died when she was three. Her, her dad remarried. He was a pastor there. And her stepmom died when she was 43. And she was so sickly most of her life that she considered that she would actually die before her dad because her dad actually lived a pretty decent age. And she, dealing with so many of the different issues of her life, she continually writes with this idea that our faith and our desires, our, our trust in the promises of God, drive our thoughts, drive our uh, preconceptions, it drives our perspective to the way that the world will be under the reign of Christ in that permanent state. And that to remind us of these things is to draw those things into the very present and to make our thoughts dwell, as she uses the word, above. All right, my favorite song. I saved my favorite for last. It is a song titled, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul. And it's really, really good. <clears throat> Dear refuge of my weary soul, on thee when sorrows rise, on thee when waves and trouble roll, my fainting hope relies. While hope revives, though pressed with fears, and I can say, my God, beneath thy feet I spread my cares and pour my woes abroad. To thee I tell each rising grief, for thou alone canst heal. Thy word can bring a sweet relief for every pain I feel. But oh, when gloomy clouds, or when gloomy doubts prevail, I fear to call thee mine. The springs of comfort seem to fail and all my hopes decline. Yet gracious God, where shall I flee? Thou art my only trust. And still my soul would cleave to thee, though prostrate in the dust. Hast thou not bid my, me seek thy face, and shall I seek in vain? And can the ear of sovereign grace be deaf when I complain? No, still the ear of sovereign grace attends the mourner's prayer. O oh, may I ever find access to breathe my sorrows there. Thy mercy seat is open still. Here let my soul retreat. With humble hope attend thy will, and wait beneath thy feet. I wanted to read that in its entirety because it's gorgeous. It reminds us when we are in despair, 
or in sorrow. To not forego one of the greatest gifts that God gives us, and that is access to him. He is not just there to solve our problems. He's there as a refuge for the weary soul. You say, well, what if, what if I doubt? You will. What if I feel discomforted? You will. Where else are you going to go? Christian, you belong to the household of God and his promises are the salve that heals any wound. Now, when you look at that and you say, well, I have this suffering and that suffering in my life and they are too grand for these things. They may be too grand to your mind, but they are not to the Lord's. You say, well, you don't know what I'm struggling with, what I, what I face, what I have to deal with. No, I don't. But God does. Place your trust in him. He will see you through it. So well, what, if it, what if that leads to my death? What if it takes away everything from me? Then he still has you. What else are you going to do? How, what other refuge is there? There are some things that this world and all of its evil enact upon us and we can't do a blasted thing about it. There the people of God are called to, as always, trust in their refuge. Trust in the Savior. There's many other things that uh, Anne wrote and many other things. I, I wanted to introduce this to you. If you'd never heard from her, go look these things up. Especially that song, Dear Refuge of My Weary Soul, and go listen to it. I can't play it on here because of copyright reasons. Um, I don't put copyrighted stuff up on here. Um, but it's easy enough to find. Go search it on YouTube and go listen to it. Uh, it is an absolutely gorgeous song. Um, I did want to get into one of her personal letters. There's several letters that have come down to us that she wrote to her sister and uh, to her father and to her aunt and to her niece um, and and several others. Um, but I wanted to include this one because it it's very personal and it is it is one of those um, ones where a daughter writes to her father as as he's well advanced in years and she's um, she's quite sickly and she doesn't know if she's going to be able to survive uh, long enough to not have not die before him. And this letter reflects that. And I wanted to read some excerpts from it um, because it really shows her heart. It shows her respect for her dad. Um, And it's, it's, it's a part of primary source history that helps us understand our sister and how she thinks. Um, And I find it just in some ways heart wrenching. She has written a lot of, at this point, she has written a lot of these hymns. Um, and um, her father desired that they be gathered together in a, in a book. And so she did so. <clears throat> and so she writes and she includes a letter with it. She says, as many of these verses, referring to her hymns, have been favored with your kind approbation. I have now at your desire collected them into a little book, which I beg leave to present to you as a humble acknowledgement of my grateful sense of your parental affection and the benefit that I have received from your instructions. If you should survive me, it will, I doubt not, be preserved by you, however inconsiderable its real value, as a mournfully pleasing remembrance of a departed child who once shared your tender regard. If you think they are capable of affording pleasure or profit, You may, if you please, communicate any of them to friends or fellow Christians. They may perhaps find seasons when the thoughts of the unworthy writer may suit their own, and the resemblance produce delight. If, while I am sleeping in the silent grave, my thoughts are of any real benefit to the meanest of servants of my God, be the praise ascribed to the Almighty Giver of all grace. May this blessed hope of Christ's finished redemption Cheer my soul amidst the pangs of dissolution. 
May the blissful smiles of my Redeemer illuminate the gloomy shades of death and point out my passage to the mansions of eternal day, that I may be able to say in the full evidence of faith and hope, I am going to be ever with the Lord. Then shall my God be glorified and my dear relatives comforted in my death. May the Almighty long preserve your valuable life and continue to make you a blessing to your family, a useful instructor to the people under your care, and an ornament of religion to religion, is the ardent wish and prayer of dear and honored father, your ever dutiful and grateful daughter, Anne Steele. A letter upon the first collection of her works made by her own hand. She not only writes to her father, she writes to anyone who would come across her writings. Uh, she includes in references a note to us, um, which is really quite fascinating as, as something we rarely get from history as somebody referring to the future uh, like that. Uh, Anne's instructions to those who would appreciate her writings at a later date. Um, she, she published her works under the pseudonym Theodosia, and so that's the reference here. Um, she writes into this uh, to anyone in the future. She says, If aught you find in Theodosius's lays, meaning her, her writings, to profit or to please, transfer the praise to him whose bounty every gift bestows, since all unmerited that bounty flows. In other words, if you take any pleasure from these things or any profit from these things, if you take any help from these things, don't give me the credit for it. Give glory to the one from whom all grace flows, because all things unmerited from him flow. Uh, and that's the same thing that we would say to our own self. Whatever we are able to do in this life, whatever things <coughs> excuse me, we uh, are afforded to in the gospel, these things continually drive us to recognize that the grace of God is beyond any of us, that it is simply uh, something quite grand indeed. Well, I would like to close this out with Anne Steele's final words uh, and the story of how she died. Um, she had been bedridden for quite some time and uh, addressed her concerns to someone um, who was able to record them um, and and they're included in her memoirs in the in the book that I linked uh, in the show notes um, you're welcome to go read it at length there's a lot more detail going on in there than what I just gave you here here was more to whet your appetite um, and to be familiar when you see a hymn written by Ann Steele you can be a little bit more familiar with who she is um, and if you've never run into that and you still don't ever run into that, go look up these hymns. Go read some of her writings. Um, people should know that she was a faithful sister of ours that um, devoted her life to the writing of things to encourage her walk with Christ and the walk with Christ of those around her, never knowing that those walks through her um, her garden on her own and the uh, more lonely life that she led would affect thousands and thousands of people after her death, uh, millions and millions uh, without knowing her name, many, many thousands knowing her name um, and being grateful that God graciously gave us someone like her in our history. And it is something that we should be grateful for. Her final words were recorded by Caleb Evans um, uh, in, in a 1780 work, Miscellaneous Pieces of Verse and Prose. Um, and he describes this. I'm going to move me over to the other side here. He describes this, and I'm going to close out with this. He says, when the interesting hour came, uh, meaning her death, she welcomed its arrival. And though her feeble body was excruciated with pain, her mind was perfectly serene. She took the most affectionate leave of her weeping friends around her, and at length the happy moment of her dismission arising. She closed her eyes, and with these animating words on her dying lips, I know that my Redeemer liveth, gently fell asleep in Jesus.
And so she rests in the care of her Savior. And so God has graced us to be able to interact with her writings and her works. And I hope it is a blessing to your ears and to your heart. May we continually follow God until we see him that endless day. One day, I look forward to meeting Anne and thanking her that God used her to graciously affect us here hundreds of years after her life. May God's blessings be with you all. Um, we are going to be back May 1st with the new walkthrough. And um, I will be posting certain aspects about this to the channel. And um, I will also be posting an announcement about this and kind of a description about it here in a couple of weeks. Um, may the Lord's blessings be, uh, be with all of you. And I look forward to catching up with you here in a couple of weeks and, um, and beginning a new walkthrough where we get to appreciate wisdom like this from all the generations that have come before us. May God make us a blessing to those who will come after us. Amen.